OK, so let's go back to our React world when we, where we see uh, how to enable these uh, fetch uh, operations to happen. First, uh, we need to focus a bit uh, on uh, uh, something that we already uh, discussed uh, in bits and pieces, but now we try to see it together. What is the life cycle of a component? Okay. Um, because it's important to understand some special point in time when something happens to, to our components. Okay? So, first of all, a component is uh, an instance of an object that are, has a very clear life cycle. The, when a component is displayed for the first time in our application, we say it's mounted on the application. So when we render for the first time a component that was not there in the page, we are mounting the component. The component is, uh, it creates the component object, the JavaScript object representing the component, initializes it, and it puts uh, the corresponding elements in the DOM. This happens at creation time. Then the component may be updated uh, many times, uh, Whenever the properties change, the input props to the component change, or the state to this component change, then it will be updated. So we, it's, uh, we already say that it's being re-rendered. We repeat the rendering process. But it's the same component. The component means that the state variable that were created during mounting are preserved and are the same. Okay. And then it may happen that that component on a render cycle doesn't appear anymore on the, on the screen. And so it's unmounted, it's destroyed. All the resources attached to this component, in particular all the state variables, are destroyed. If the component uh, appears again, so imagine something that is shown and then not shown anymore, and then in the next render cycle it's shown again, it will be a different uh, component, a different instance that will be reinitialized from scratch. So every component is only mounted once. Remember this sentence. Mounting only happens once, updating happens many times, may happen many times. Okay? So uh, we saw that, uh, remember, when we had the edit form, okay? that form that remembered the previous data until you closed it and reopened it again, and then it was a new component. And we were controlling this mechanism by providing the key property. Now, changing the key means uh, it's a new component. And so destroy the old one and recreate a new one. So there's no going back. Once a component is unmounted, it cannot be revived in any way. You can create another one, Another instance of the same component, but it will be another instance, okay? So these are the three points. And in these three moments of the life cycle, of the life of a component, uh, different things may happen. And the React divides uh, the operation that may happen in two different phases. They are called them render phase and commit phase. So the render phase uh, is the one that runs in a functional way. Okay. Uh, when I mount the component, I run the function once uh, from the beginning to the end, wait for the return statement, and uh, once I have the component returns, uh, it will return a fragment of HTML. And this fragment is put into the DOM in the commit phase. Okay, the render phase is always functional. It must not have any side effects. I cannot modify any global variables. I cannot do any external operations and so on. The commit phase, by definition, affects something external to the React application. It modifies the DOM, for example. It creates elements on the page. And it, that is where something outside the functional behavior may happen. 
side effects uh, may happen in the commit phase. Uh, side effects, uh, we see the definition, is everything which is outside the functional core of React. Um, so the function is executed at, at mounting time, and that after that, uh, React updates the DOM, and we can run, and this is our focus today, we can run other side effects uh, to be executed after the rendering of the component. Okay? And this code will be run outside the functional execution. So it can do, it, it's allowed to do strange things, okay? Or non-functional things. And the same goes for the updating. Um, in updating, we are re running the function again, the same function. We can modify the states and so on. We render a page that uh, render a new, a new version of the content that will, in turn, possibly update the DOM on the page if the render is different. And we may also run something later. What, what happens is that uh, if we do something in this part, for example, we know that. User clicks on a button, clicks on, on, a, on a link. Then the, this triggers in an asynchronous way, in a non-functional way, some procedure that may modify the states. Okay? This is what we are doing when you click on the button. We modify the state, and modifying the state, it triggers a new update. So re-execute the function with the new value of the state. Again, okay? And so we modify the DOM after the component is rendered. Right now, the only you know, external causes for um, modifying this, this, the state were only linked uh, to DOM actions, something coming from the user, from the DOM nodes, events on the DOM nodes. Now we are also adding some events that may happen on the, uh, for other causes, the side effects. Hmm? So there's a moment in time after rendering when side effect may happen. What is a side effect? The definition is here, is any calculation that doesn't target the output values, anything that affects, uh, or anything that affects something outside the scope of the function component being executed. Strange definition that says some operation that is, uh, whose result is not directly used uh, to build the render. It's something that may change something else, may involve external resources. By the way, the console is something external to the web page. A remote API server is something external to the web page. A timer is something external to the web page. Something where some things, some events may happen that are not under direct control of the React scheduler, of the React renderer, okay? Um, in particular, data fetching or API calling is something like that. When I read some data, it comes from outside and it will come asynchronously. React likes uh, to control when it's rendering a component, but if I load something from outside, and as you can imagine, as we, as, we can ima as we can imagine, we cannot put an await statement inside the component. Because the component must be functional, must be, it will be called many times by React, whenever it needs. So any operation that interacts with the time, with the outside, should not happen in the render body, in the component body. And so that's, uh, uh, something for us to think, uh, the component, if you run it from the first to the last line, should always be functional and should not have any, we should not try to do any side effects. Of course, we can schedule something to have a side effect, but not doing it there, not doing it in, in, the, in the sequential code. And on the other hand, if we have a, a function or a callback which is performing side effects, we know that it cannot affect the current rendering. 
So there's no way in which we can call a component and the component, uh, I don't know, uh, waits for something else and the result of this something else will affect uh, how we render the, 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 the page in this render cycle. The execution of the function will also render something. If something in parallel happens, it may affect the next rendering, but not the current one. Okay? So a side effect logic will always be able to schedule something and not to do something immediately. So, but we'll see. Uh, okay, this is the same in the in a picture format. So, how to manage these side effects with this? Well, there are two ways of doing something asynchronously. With an, with an event handler, on click, we don't click, I do in some code. And uh, with uh, use effect. What is use effect? It's a hook that is able to uh, wrap some code that has some, if, some uh, side effect uh, to be executed separately from the main render code. We are not doing that normally, but uh, uh, officially, the console is outside the application. So logging something to the console that we are using for debugging, technically, is a side effect. In fact, we, maybe we see that the message is printed many times because we have decided to render the component twice for debugging purposes. And we, we see the, the message is more than once in the console. Technically, we should say, okay, this is affecting uh, something outside the component, so it's uh, classified as a side effect, and so we should uh, execute that in the context of the user effect hook. That where we can control when and how many times uh, this is executed. If we put something in the body of the component, we never know how many times it will be called or when it will be called. It's up to React. And so if, if it's something that, you know, uh, it just, if this log uh, is a log of payments that you need to do, I give you, uh, I owe you two euros, uh, I owe you two euros. If, if the component is rendered 10 times, uh, you are owing 20 euros because you are printing 20 debts. You only want it to happen once, for example. So you want control over when and how many times a given operation is done. And this control cannot be given if you put the operation inside the body of a component. Because you are not controlling when the component is called. That's the key point. Use effect may have this purpose. There's something that will affect some external world, and they can control and execute it. How we see how it works. Okay. Then, this is the, the theory. For logging something in debug mode, it's perfectly OK. OK, there's not, uh, as long as we remove it uh, at the end, but uh, OK, we know that something is printed more than once, we know what is happening uh, for just uh, logging. But imagine something that has a real effect. Uh, uh, you, should, you should be able to control it. OK, so how does use effect work? Use effect registers a callback, <coughs> which is the first parameter, to be executed according to some condition. And the condition is the second parameter. The condition is an array that contains objects that are monitored for changes. So there are an array containing dependencies. Each dependency is a variable. And whenever one of these variables changes, the function is executed. So basically, what, I, what I'm saying is uh, schedule or when I run user effect, nothing happens in the call. It will store this callback 
and we'll call this callback when one or more of these dependent variables change their value from true to false, or from five to six, from undefined to defined, or something like that. Okay, so automatically, whenever one of these variables change, automatically the execution of the callback is triggered, and so it will be executed. So we may execute some action. as a consequence of a state change or of a props change. Okay? No matter why the props changes or no matter why the state changes, when it changes, I can do something. It will monitor variables, it will not monitor values. Uh, so that also, this, uh, because we cannot check uh, the value for efficiency reasons, you cannot evaluate all, all the expression every time. So we'll just check whether something has been modified or not. But we'll come to that. Um, so, like an event handler. An event handler, we're scheduling some callback to be called when the user does something. In an effect, we are scheduling some callback to be called when some data changes, not user. Uh, yes, we say that this is a very dense API because it's very, quite, it looks like it's simple, okay? It's just two parameters, one callback, one list of dependencies. Actually, the designer of this tried to pack as many functionalities as they could into this simple interface. So there are a lot of corner cases here, okay? Um, for example, the dependency array, the second argument, may be missing, empty, or containing something. And there are different meanings. If the second argument is missing, the effect is run at every render. Every time the component is updated, it will be run. Okay? If we want something to, to be updated always. Second case, I have a second argument which is an empty array. In this case, uh, the um, callback is only executed once in the lifetime of, our, of the component uh, at the mounting time, when the component is first created and is mounted. Okay, so no argument means always. One empty argument means once. And the normal case is where we have a set of props or state values, so a list of, a list of properties or a list of states, uh, they cannot be expressions, they must be variables. Okay? Um, and it runs when? Once, at the beginning, always. So at the initial rendering, at the mounting time, the callback is always called. When the component is first mounted, in the three cases, we call the, uh, the callback. Then, in the first case, at every render, we are scheduling it again. In the entire range, we are not scheduling it anymore after the first call. And in the other case, uh, whenever one of these, uh, one or more of these variables change, it will be executed again. If only one of these variables will change, it will be called once. If more than one variable changes at the same time, it will be also called once, not one for every little change, okay? Um, so, the syntax is like that. Uh, in a function component, use effect, my callback, and I don't have the second argument. It's undefined, basically. Or I have a second argument which is empty, or I have a second argument that contains variables. So there are three different ways of using that. Acting on the dependency array controls the frequency in which the callback is called. Okay. Um, so, 
So this is an example of a counter count component, OK? that displays the number value of a prop. So it receives a prop called number, and it returns this number. OK? This is the rendering. Simple. We know what the component is rendering just by reading it, ignoring everything else. The return statement tells me everything. Use state, use effect, set state are all stuff that we'll schedule for later. But for now, I'm printing the, my, the value of my property. And uh, for debug, maybe, I'm also printing the value. And I schedule two different effects one with uh, uh, an empty dependency, and the other with a dependency on the property. And what we see is that the user of this component uh, uh, uses the component in a way that uh, the number state counts. So I'm passing this property number from a state variable, and I'm incrementing this state variable when I click on the button, OK? This is outside my code. So it means that the count component is created, and then its count number is changed one or two or three times, depending on the user action. But this is outside the component, OK? We don't care about that. What we care is that the component is a property, and this property changes. And if this property changes, the, the displayed HTML will change accordingly. We don't see this in this slide. We don't have the web page here in this slide. But this is, already the, this is the first exercise that we did to increment a number in React. Now, the effects. We see that both effects print the value of the number, but we see that the first effect is only called once. You see that it's printed only once here, while the second one is printed many times every time the num, num property has changed. So you never see it printed with, twice with the same value. If the component is re-rendered for any other reason, this effect is not executed. If the component is re-rendered because number changes, then the callback is called again. So we decide what we need to do, of course. Both of are correct. There's no right or, way, or wrong way to do. It depends on what we need. Okay? We know we can control it. If we need to do something for initializing the component, uh, we do it only once. If we, not, we to, if we need to do something to keep the component up to date uh, with regards to some other property, then we need to schedule it uh, to be run also during the, the updates. Um, this is the detailed timeline of what happens in this example. So the component is created. Uh, and the caller that we don't see here initialize the component with count uh, with number equal to three. Okay, so this is the creation of the component, the mounting of the component. Okay, mounting the component as a render phase and update phase. What does the render phase do? Execute the function body, and it will create div prop. Uh, div three with div with, the, uh, div with a three number in it. This is the render phase. The function count is called. Use effects uh, while calling the function. I am seeing these use effect hooks uh, that are seen for the first time and they are registered. Remember that the hooks uh, are something that is set aside and stored uh, together with a component uh, to be used later. Also the state. Now use state does the same thing. This, the first thing, you, you are creating it. And then it will, be able, uh, will be alive as long as the component is alive. So I'm registering the callbacks, but I'm not executing anything until I finish the render phase. And finishing the render phase means returning this code. 
After I finish the render phase, I go, so the tree is rendered. After I, I finish the render phase, I start the update phase. And in the update phase, the effects may run. So in the update phase, I go and look, which are the effects that I need to run here now? Well, those uh, that were just uh, discovered for a newly mounted component, and in this case, both of them. The rule is that every effect always runs at the mount time, at the mount time, okay? So you see that, uh, okay, the component just mounted, so run the first effect, and it prints my, the first line. Then the component just mounted, so also run the second effect. And the second line. That's it. The update phase is done. We are running all the side effects for the current component. Everything is stable until somebody, some user, clicks on a button outside, and this button will change the value of this property. The value is changed, so the life cycle says I need to update the component. Updating the component means running the function again. So outside, somebody changes num. So the function is called. Rendering phase, what is the return? It's a four. After the rendering phase, there will be a new update phase. And I'm asking myself, which are the side effects that I need to update this time? Well, the component is not new, so I will only render the component for which a dependency has been declared. Sorry, I will only execute the effects, not render the component, I will only execute the effects for which a dependency has been triggered. In this case, the first one will not be triggered because we have no dependency, the second one will be triggered, and so we're printing my dynamic number is four. <laughs> and then we finish also the update stage for this component. Until a new property changes, then we start again. First we render, then we update. Okay? So remember that all, the, all these callbacks, when they run, they don't all run at every time, but when they run, they run after the return. In my mind, I see them after the return. I need to write them at the top, because remember the hooks should be the first statements, but they run at the bottom, at the very bottom, after the return. In, if we think in sequential way. So how does use state and use effect interact with each other? Use state creates a state variable, and a state variable we already know that whenever the state variable changes, it will trigger a new re-render. That's it. Additionally, a state variable may be used in the dependency array of a, of a use effect. This means that when I change a state variable, the very change of the variable may trigger an execution of the effect. Sooner or later. Remember that when I do a set state, uh, I'm not changing the state. I'm scheduling the state to be changed in the future. And when the change happens, then the effect may run. So never, never something happens in the moment when you write it. If the state is updated, so I call a set state, but for some reason, the new value of the state is identical to the old one, then the effect doesn't run. So the effect don't track the assignments, but really they do to track the changes. If I reassign the same value over and over again, the effect doesn't see any, any difference, and so it doesn't run. If I assign a new value, of course, it would run. So I create a state, I use a state as a dependency of an effect. And so every time the state changes for some reason, the effect is run. So the effect can in some way track what is happening to the state. And also the other way is possible. Um, inside the user effect, I can call 
a set state. So when the effect is triggered, when the effect is executed, uh, I can schedule a state change. I can call set, set count or whatever inside the effect code. Of course, I'm aware that I'm, if I'm changing the state, uh, then I'm also implying that the component needs to be re-rendered and also its children if this state is used uh, as a prop in some of the children, of course. But it's no different from uh, when we call a set state inside an event handler. No? When we click a set state a number plus one, we know that the state, the local state changes, so the local component will be rendered and the children also. We can change the state not just from inside an event handler, but also from inside uh, uh, an effect handler. Hmm? Just beware. So uh, this is another example that shows this kind of interaction. Let's look at the code. Now we have a state open. A gate can be open or closed, OK? What are we rendering? Let's start always from the render. Um, all the rest are just something that we put aside. The first execution goes to the return and says, OK, I render a, a div that says go or stop, depending on the value of the state open. And initially, the state open is false. So at the mount time, this component will render what? We render a false uh, it's a stop. OK? We initialize a, a state with a value false, and we initialize a user effect that depends on open. And then a function, open me, that we use uh, on the on-click event. But until we click here, this function is never issued. It's never looked at, it's never executed, OK? So the component is created, is mounted. We call the function, oh, sorry, and we return stop. Then the component is created for the first time. Therefore, the effects are executed. And executing the effect sets this timeout. I'm setting a timeout. Uh, the timeout expires. So the timeout is set. At this point, uh, the component rendering is finished. Render update. In the render, I have stop. And in the update, I set a timeout. This is a, side effect, a possible side effect, setting a timeout. Something external to the application. That's it. Then. Outside the control of React, the timeout may, may will, after 500 milliseconds, will trigger. So we have another step, and this step here, the timeout expires, is outside React. It's outside the control of React. It's an external side effect, totally asynchronous, totally uncontrolled. And if the timeout expires, then the callback is uh, executed. And what does this callback do? Call set open to false. And then it ends. Set open to false doesn't change the value of the state open, but it will schedule the change of the state open. OK, so after a while, not when the set open is executed, but after a while, open becomes false because set open was called with false. And, and nothing happens, because state, uh, sorry, open was already false. So a state that was initialized in false, after 500 milliseconds, I'm setting it again to false. OK. If you're happy, let's do that. Hmm? OK. After a while, the user can click on the button. Clicking on the button triggers the callback, the event callback. And the event calls set open, and this time the value will be true. 
So what happens now is that the user clicks, I call a callback, the callback calls set open. This is asynchronous in the event handler. Set open will change, schedule a change for the value open to true. Set open, open becomes true. Because it has been scheduled just a minute away, a minute again from the, by the set open. State changes, therefore the component is re-rendered. Render phase, always before the render uh, the other, okay? First we re-render the component, and this time we see we render this div, the same div, where open this time is true, and so we write go. So we render a go. When the user clicks on the button, we immediately render a go. Well, immediately, microseconds. And we are go. And then we go to the, so we finish the render phase by rendering a go, and we go to the update phase and see, are there any effects to run? Oh, yeah, the state uh, that depends on open. Open just uh, switch it from false to true. So I need to execute the effect. And so we set the timeout. Again, another timeout. And we finish the update phase by scheduling the timeout. The go is displayed and the timeout is running. React is idle, it doesn't have anything to do. After 500 milliseconds, the timeout fires. The timeout callback is executed and called set open to false. Okay, so after 500 milliseconds, I scheduling a, the assignment of false to the state open and immediately after, as soon as possible, this state will be changed to false. The uh, component is re-rendered because the state changed, and now with false, we display stop again. Okay, and so actually what we have is a gate that when we click on the button, goes from stop to go, stays go for 500 milliseconds, and then automatically comes, uh, come, returns and comes back to stop. The story is not finished, because we now restored the, uh, the state to false, right? We have, in the render phase, we render a stop again. But in the update phase, we notice that the state has changed again, because it went from true to false. And so we are executing the effect again. The state is already false, and we are scheduling to set the state to false once more after 500 milliseconds. So this is quite stupid, by the, by the way, OK? When the state is already false, why do you schedule it to become false after 500 milliseconds? So a more meaningful way was, uh, should have been to put an if statement here. If open, set the amount to close. Because this call, this callback, it will be executed any time the state goes from open to, to, from false to true, or from true to false. But maybe we only need to do something on some changes, not all changes. When we see that it goes to true, I need to schedule it to come back to false. When I see that it's already false, I, it's stupid to schedule something that will uh, convert it to false. By the way, it's also dangerous because if the user clicks uh, um, more rapidly than 500 milliseconds, uh, I, the risk is that, is that I close the, the gate before the real timeout because I'm, I'm applying the previous timeout of the previous closing. It's just, there's a risk condition here 
very small, but. So, but the mechanism is D. Always try to de decouple what is happening why, uh, when. Hmm? The render happens when the state changes or the prop changes. That's it. The effect uh, runs when the component is mounted or when the state is changed or the dependencies are changed. The event handlers are executed when the user does some action. So we have these three different uh, moments in which uh, operations can be done. And they trigger each other through properties and states, which are the real only communication mechanism between the different type of functions here in React. Um, <coughs> There are some, some warnings, but maybe we see the warnings uh, uh, next week. We'll continue. This is a quite, quite uh, long topic here, so we continue with the exercise next week. Uh, uh, but let's try for today to put together what we learned about fetch and what we learned about effects uh, so that we can start working with that. Uh, user effect can perform side effects of many types. We saw logging, we saw setting timeouts, very boring, or also calling APIs using fetch. So basically, whenever we want to use fetch, it, it's a side effect, and so it must be inside some asynchronous code, even tender or effect, or use effect. Never ever fetch outside, be called outside of one of these two. Uh, environments, okay? So, uh, imagine that we are rendering a component with a list of employees or whatever. And the component needs to know the list of employees, uh, and this list is only available in the server. And so, what can we do? We could uh, schedule an API call in this case, a uh, fetch of a get with some parameter or whatever, that uh, fetches uh, the employees. So we have, what would we have? We have an effect where the fetch is called and uh, asynchronously will complete. We are waiting for that. We are waiting for the JSON. And all of this is happening on the side. After we have all the information, we do the key in instruction, which is set employees. We change the state. OK, so we do all the client-server interaction in an asynchronous function. When we have the result, we can call set state to transfer the result inside the React, inside the component. And uh, this effect uh, should be, or uh, also this, this get, actually, fetch means making an HTTP call, an HTTP get call in this case, is uh, executed every time the parameter of this uh, get changes in some way. So if it's a static uh, URL, like get questions, it only, be, it only needs to be run once. But if it contains a parameter like get uh, answers to question number one, this number one is, will be a property of the component, probably. The component or the route or the state. But whenever this number changes, uh, we know that we need to rerun the fetch because we need to find answers to a different question. And so we must schedule this uh, API to run whenever the query parameter, the question ID, change. Hmm? And after we do the set employees, uh, the rendering is uh, automatically uh, applied. Okay. Um, we have. Uh, Sorry, I forgot something to tell you something. So 
Yeah, I, I don't see the light. Maybe I lost it. No, because there's a detail that tells me that uh, the callback cannot be an asynchronous function. Okay, uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, I was searching the slide, but uh, maybe it's at the end. Uh, that this uh, is a rule. No. The callback may be any function, the callback for a user effect, uh, and we're talking about user effect, uh, cannot be an asynchronous function. Why? Because, uh, yeah, when we're talking that uh, the, the API of uh, user effect is very dense, uh, the callback, the return value for the callback is significant, is important. The callback may return a function. And this function will be executed when the component is unmounted. So it's quite a strange thing. Okay, so you have a callback that is, will be executed at mount time and possibly at, at the update time. And it's normal. Then maybe I have something to do when the component is unmounted. Okay, so release some result. Maybe I open a connection with somebody when I show the component and then when the component goes away, I need to close this connection or to, uh, to release some resources. So I need to do something before destroying the component. And uh, user effect also provides you, basically gives you, uh, allows you to specify two callbacks. One in rendering, normal rendering, normal dating, and one in the unmounting. The issue is that the second callback for the unmounting callback, the cleanup callback, is not an argument uh, of user effect, would be normal. I have to call two callbacks, one at the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end. No. They only provide the one callback. And the cleanup callback is a function that the normal callback should return. They are crazy. So if the normal callback returns a very, normally a callback doesn't return anything because you are not calling it <laughs> directly. So the return value of a callback is, is not important normally. The important thing is what it does, not what it returns. <coughs> Especially if it's asynchronous. Okay? An asynchronous callback normally doesn't return anything. In this case, they decided the return value is significant and it must be a function. And if a callback returns a function, then this function is called during unmounting and can be used for cleaning up operations. It's very rare to be to, that we need this. So it's very seldom used, but it defines the interface. Okay, that's one story. And what does it do with a synchronous function? <laughs> the fact is that when I declare a function to be a sync, automatically this function returns a promise. Always. So there's a conflict between user effect that expected the callback to return nothing or a function. Nothing if we don't need the callback or a function if we need the cleanup callback. And in, uh, instead, if we declare the function as sync, it will return a promise. And the user effect doesn't know what to do with a promise as a return value. Okay? So that is why we cannot, can never put a sync in the in the body of a user effect. And we need to do this trick, like we have here. In the body of the user effect, we call a function. So the body of the, the callback of the user effect is a synchronous, a normal synchronous function. Right? Here. This is the callback. There's no async keyword here. The body of this is calling this function. The only instruction in this body. What is this function? It's a function that I, I just defined here, and this function is asynchronous. So the callback it set is synchronous, and inside it contains one instruction that calls an async function. Yes, if what you're thinking is true. Okay. They drank too much. But that's the rule. 
Okay, remember, if you need to put a sync here in a user effect, don't do that. Uh, just create a nested function and call it. <sighs> to be honest, a sync uh, is too much of an expectation. No? Writing a sync uh, doesn't, need, doesn't mean that the function is asynchronously executed. Any function in JavaScript is asynchronously executed. A sync just means I return a promise. It's an easier way, easier way to handle a promise. So, there's nothing special of calling an async function inside a sync function. It's not the problem. Hmm? It's the, the dangerous <laughs> operation is await. It's not a sync. A sync is just a declaration. Hmm? It's all, a sync means automatically wrap this into a promise. Nothing more. Okay. So, with this basic knowledge, uh, we can maybe start moving that, uh, this knowledge into our uh, application. How much do we have? Half an hour, okay? Uh, for example, let's start uh, uh, rendering the list of questions or the list of answers or whatever. The list of questions in the first page of the application, okay? Um, so we are trying now, step by step, to remove all the static information that we had in the application and to load this information from the server. And then to uh, replace the modification to the local state with the modification to the remote state. So that the real state of the application is, will be in the database, not in the client application. Okay, we are sort of remoting all state reading and state writing operations to the database through the API. So let's first start maybe with the, so with the, the server here is running, okay? At the same time, we should have, and uh, let me close the simple client that we had before. Say it goodbye. The server is running. Okay. Let's move to the client. Here in this folder, QA client, I just copied what we had last week. Nothing more. Just copied it over. And I open a second terminal and with the QI client. So what, what, last week it was called uh, React QA. Now we need to distinguish between the server side and the client side, so I call them one client and one server folder. <coughs> and I run in them side, side by side, npm run dev. That is wrong because you need probably to install the dependencies. No? What are you telling me? Could not read packet.json? Quick 11, QA client. Okay, sorry, for some reason I didn't copy package.json. Let me copy it from last week. Paste here. Install with the S. Okay. Okay, we are here. 
So, but even the main the JSX, it didn't take copy anything. Okay, so I, the source, and there's nothing copied here on the QA client. Sorry, my mistake. And the uh, source is there. Let's copy everything. Okay, sorry for the. Okay, so uh, remember the, this page here was the, for the list of questions. We still don't have it because in our fake data we didn't have any, any questions stored. And we are rendered that uh, in. Uh, so let's find the correct week. We are in week uh, 11, okay? You are client, let's close everything else. And we have uh, um, in app, the home page renders, uh, the home page route renders this simple paragraph here, okay? List of questions and so on. So we may want to render an actual component with the list of questions, okay? So we can create inside components uh, a new component called the question. Oh, we already have questions, sorry. Um, question component, sorry, what, what they were doing here, and maybe for a, for a different version. Ah, no, sorry. The question component is the one that shows the question header and then the other. So uh, let's call it a question list. JSX. Okay? Now we want to render this. inside the application. So uh, we have this uh, element that would be a question list element instead of this. Okay, so right now this component is empty. And so in the home page, I'm rendering this component in this place. Now, this component must load from the API the data it needs. When? At the beginning. Okay? When it loads. So, what we must have here is some state variable that uh, 
contains the list of questions. Questions, set questions. And initially, that would be an empty array, of course. By default, we don't know. We don't have an initial value. I want to load it from the database. And when the component is mounted, I need to load this list of questions from the API. So I set a user factor to call the API when? Only when the component mounts. It doesn't need to be updated. It doesn't need to be called many times only when this component is mounted. So, empty array. The dependency array is empty means that the component is only rendered, the, the callback is only called once. Now, we, uh, what do we need to do here? Well, we could call the function that uh, uh, allows us to set the state. So imagine we are calling the API server, and at the end we set we call set questions with the list of questions that we just received from the server. Okay, so uh, something like const. my questions from some API load questions call that will allow me to do a set questions of the questions. There's some, ah, it's an error missing here. Okay. User factor, of course, should be also imported from the React library. Okay. So the idea is uh, I'm scheduling to call an API, an external API, and the result of this API will be used to update the state. Okay, of course it means that, uh, um, sorry, my questions. Okay, so I, I imagine uh, having an, an API file somewhere so that all the fetch operations are confined in a single file that does all the input output operation in order to make the components you know, cleaner so that all the information about the API, the fetch, the addresses are stored in a separate file that we call here. So uh, we can have inside the source, instead, instead of a components, uh, we may have a, f a folder, you know, call, we call API, and inside that uh, we may have a file like api.js. where we define a set of functions, no? uh, maybe function, uh, I called it uh, load questions. And then at the end we export all these functions. And we need, so we may have many, in this API file, we may have many functions and we export all of them. And if the component need them, we just need to import uh, let's say, yeah, API from, uh, here we have, uh, Go back to API. API. Something like that. S 
So we can play a game here where we are returning just uh, a paragraph with uh, the questions. Uh, and we save this. Okay. So you will load the application. Let me see, we did everything, okay? Slash should render question list. Question list should render just a list of questions. And, but this is empty. I did something wrong. Syntax error. Okay. Uh, like that. Okay, this is just a uh, question number, navigation bar, okay. Okay, so right now, let's see if we are printing the right thing, if you're rendering something. Yes. Okay, right now we have this asterisk with, with a list of questions inside, but the list of questions now is an empty array, so it doesn't print anything. Now imagine that the API returns uh, an array with A, B, C, D, F, whatever. And now we're, we're printing it here. Okay, so right now from the point of view of this component, every time the component is rendered for the first time, we will call these load questions to update its state. We don't see it, but uh, on the first uh, run, you don't see it because it's too fast. On the first run, the component, the component is rendered twice. The first time is rendered with the, so where this, with the default value of the state, will be empty. Then after a set state is done, so then the effect is run, the effect loads the question, sets the states. When the state is changing, we render the component again, this time with the value. Okay? So for a little while, we will have an empty page, but then we will. Uh, we could also test it here, okay? If the, uh, the array is empty, then write something like loading, some loading indicator, some spinner icon. And then we replace it when the question change. Okay, it's something that. Okay, now the real thing. Instead of returning again fake data, and this is also useful because we already separ uh, we have separated the return of fake data from the usage of such data. From the point of this of this function, there's still a little detail, but uh, from the point of view of this function, we don't know where these questions are coming from. Right now, they are coming from some stub, local stub, but now we are changing them to come from the server. And uh, we made, in this module, know that the server lies on a website called localhost. 3001, like this. And then uh, what are the examples here? A slash API. 
this is the location of the API server, and then slash questions or whatever, so slash API. And so we know that uh, in this case, uh, a lot of questions should call the API from the server with a fetch. It's a get statement, it's easy. From the uh, URL slash questions. This returns a response. The response is a const response await fetch. The await requires me to declare this function as a sync. And then let's assume everything is right. We don't do error management right here, but we should do. We extract the data. Await. Response to JSON. So we can extract the object containing the question. And we can return this object. Sorry? This is the, yes, is uh, uh, reading the body of the response, uh, parsing that as a JSON, and returning the object. Hmm? So if you write uh, response.text, uh, you get a string with the body. Response.json, you, you parse the string and create the, 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 the JavaScript object. So in this case, it will be an array of two objects. And that's near it, nearly, because now it crashes. Well, because return question, what does it return? An array? No. This is an async function. The return returns a promise that results to the array. Okay? So the um, sorry, question list is re receiving this, uh, but this is uh, still a promise. It's not yet the data. We should await, right, for extracting the data from the promise. So, load question, we made that as a, an asynchronous uh, function. Okay. It's asynchronous, so it returns a promise. I don't care about the promise, I care about the content of the promise. So I can await for it. If I, if I await for it, I, I should make this a sync. But I, can, I cannot do this because in an effect, uh, the callback cannot be an asynchronous function. And so I would need to define, to cut it short, let's use then instead of await. Hmm? So the idea is, uh, Instead of a wait, just for this reason that making an async in, in an user effect requires a couple of my, or a couple of more instructions, say so let's call a lot of questions, then questions, which is the result value of the the fulfillment value of the promise, will be used in set question. So this set question is. Like that. Uh, maybe I write it in the same way, so I will be happy. Oh, there's a lot of async stuff here, okay? The effect will run asynchronously after the first render. It will start, you call a, a function that will start an asynchronous fetch that will re return a response there, that will asynchronously parse the body, return an object, and when the body is received, I will execute this asynchronous callback that finally will change the state. 
When I do set questions, I'm at home again because I'm again in the React model, props and states. Uh, yes. In this case, of course, I, I shouldn't just print an object. I should uh, uh, return a map this object to a list, for example. Okay, so I have a div that contains uh, um, a list of lines with the question names, for example. Okay, so we have uh, questions dot map every question. should be rendered uh, maybe as a paragraph with the question name text. Yeah. So, but this is just rendering code, okay? Is the same rendering that could have, we, do, we could have done before because we have a questions which is an array of objects and we must with a map transform an array of objects into an array of uh, react elements uh, or here is uh, complaining that it didn't provide the key yes I know huh? I, I could put it here if I if you really want So that React is, happy, is happier with, with its, when it sees the key. But this is just rendering. So we are rendering this twice, one with an empty array and one with a filled array. Here we can render whatever we want, of course. Right now we are in the render mode. We have a state and we just process in the state. The new thing for today is that the state has been loaded effectively from the database. We should also be aware that the first, at the first render, questions will be an empty array. Okay? So what we write here should cover for that possibility. So if I write a question zero for taking the first element, it will crash the first time because there's not yet any first element. Okay, so either we are sure that the first, the first render is valid if we are putting here an empty array, it works, okay? Or we simply no, make two, ca two cases. If uh, uh, questions dot length equal to zero, we just return loading as we return all of this, for example. And we don't, you see that the loading appeared for a moment. I will load again. No. It was fast because the, the, the server is fast at responding, but uh, we see that uh, uh, for a moment uh, it will show the rendering of the first. In this case, it's perceivable because it's no longer fake data, local fake data. It's something that actually require the, 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 the server to be a query and there's all the HTML handshake. Now it's fast, of course, because the data is small. Okay? So this is our first step. Every, we still need a, a, a lot to discuss, to discuss a lot. For example, where is the best place to, to put this state? Should every component have its own state or should the state be all lifted to to up, for example, we must decide how to handle reading, not just reading, but also writing, so updating. So that's all the work that we need to do this week, next week. In next week, we'll try to see how to use this pattern. This is very, very simple. A component only needs once at the beginning to load some data, which is not parametric. 
the simplest case. Next week, we'll try to make it more complex. Okay? Okay, well, thank you.